Does anybody know who Harville Hendrix is? So Bryn, I think, I don't know if she is or was or whatever doing a show with him and she really wanted me to check him out and that's one of the things that he talks about is like, you know, for, for non, not good communication with your partner is asking questions that aren't really questions. You know, like, what is that music? I know what that music is, Rob. I'm saying I don't like it. Okay, good. Uh, what else? Anything else? Because I, I, I'm thinking you guys are kind of full. It seems like a full weekend. What? No, you're not? <laughs> we saw what happened last time when we got full. <laughs> we found a way to discharge. <laughs> so we, remember, we're just... So is there anything else you guys want? Um, anything else you guys want? That's good. There's an article um, in the New York Times that I thought was good by the dude that wrote Open to Desire. Mark Epstein, and, and it's a good article, you know, for a Buddhist. It's um, uh, uh, that we're all traumatized. Did anybody see that? I posted it on my Facebook. It's, you know, it gives us permission to be fucked up. <laughs> yeah. So I was just thinking about... It, there's not, it seems invalid to say levels of trauma or deepness of trauma because if it's traumatic, it's traumatic. And, or, I mean, if one is looking at sort of structurally how much is the brain changed. Um. Well, see, here is how I look at it. Um, if you take Pooja's model, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and really what I heard from Pooja's model, and she's really developing a, a, an extraordinarily elegant new, really, between Teresa and Pooja, we are, and, and then Will is the bridge, the dude, um, we are going to have, oh God, and oh, there's so many people, and the, we are going, I think we're going to have a totally different, uh, potentially different model for mm -hmm. a way to, to look at these things than we have. You know, one of the things I love about Butch is he's just like, there is no language, and he'll wrestle out language, right? Um, and, and our whole idea of, um, what's his name that I love, Bucky? Uh, you know, of creating a new model rather than tearing down the old one uh, really could come to fruition. I mean, I don't, it's not, it's like, you know, highly, high, I mean, at this point, like crazy reputable people are going to Puja saying, we don't have a model that works, what do we do? And the model that we're putting forth is getting into the hands of like the top thinkers in the world. So we're, you know, and then Reese is bringing it to DARPA. So like, the, it, like at this point, Reese did, you guys missed this, it was great. He did this great talk when he came uh, to One Taste uh, for, you know, for all of the people who had helped with Omex. Oh. Wasn't it great? And he was like, you guys, you know, you think, oh, you know, this is all a dream. Well, first of all, you weren't here when it first started. It was just Rob and me, and we really didn't think it was a dream. <laughs> but we ate a lot of burritos. Um, and and so, so, like, just knowing how fast this thing is accelerating. But the other thing is, you know, Reese did this great talk. He was like, you know, I was in Xerox Park. There were 10 of us. There were 10 of us just figuring out how to use, plug into these phone lines that would get one phone line talking to another phone line, and that was the beginning of the internet in the room that he sat in with 10 people. And so these visions that we have, like they can sound kind of wow. So as Pooja brings forth this idea, you know, and, and it's the fundamental idea we've been working with, but she's actually courageous enough to add, meta, to take, really to take all of her years in medicine and put it behind and then go into the lab and reverse engineer everything we experience. See, because we know experientially um, trauma, tumescence, is just stuff that's stuck in the body that needs discharge. Mm -hmm. We know that in experience. And what Pooja's doing is going into the lab and lo and behold, she's proving it. And so, 
then you look at the next level, which is, you know, we talk about the um, awakening cycle. Remember, consciousness meets the environment, either with positive or negative. And then we talk about the fact that the negative judgment brings you down into the bottom to collect more of the blocked energy, the, in, in Buddhism, the sankara, right? And then, but then you can bring it up again for discharge. So, in, in a sense, um, almost like the more trauma you have, the more potential for discharge you have. It's awesome. So all of you fucked up people are, we have tremendous potential. <laughs> That's our message. <laughs> And, and the, the other message is, yes, it does um, get stronger and more concentrated as you revisit it. But I, my guess is, and I'll, I'm going to say this to Pooja, and then she's going to bring it to the lab, and we'll prove it. My guess is, you know how we talk about how you have to have ambivalence, that that's an element, because you need that kind of friction? My guess is that you're going back again, because I don't know if you've ever had this experience, where like, I go back and revisit something thousands of times until it blows up and I'm free of it. And I think you're just sending your mind into climax. When you're going back and replaying something, you're sending your mind into climax to get that discharge. Hmm. Boy, somebody is beginning to just come out like a wild child. Boy. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to piggyback on what she was saying because some of it came out of our conversation about my freeze response, which we all know. Um, so it came, as far as I know, from many, many years of bullying, and I think I made the comment, like, but it wasn't really bad trauma, like it wasn't that... It, I died or someone died or someone was raped. So um, just in this whole conversation, like part of what I'm getting curious about is what's the best way to complete the throw or to get to the other side of that kind of a response from that kind of trauma? Well, this is, I'm glad you asked that uh, because I think it's actually the antidote um, to the creating the dictator, um, but also the antidote to the repression which is what Creating the Dictator was looking to be an antidote for. And I think what you do, I mean, this is going to be my suggestion every time, is you ohm a lot. As you ohm, whatever is in there begins to come out. What I was saying, where's Ravi? What I was saying to Ravi is, you, the thing is, you don't make it come out. You create enough heat that it begins to come out naturally. And then when it begins to come out naturally, you ensure that you don't block it. Well, how do you ensure that you don't block it if you've blocked it every time and you have a habituated response of blocking it? Fear inventory. Because fear inventory is what discharges the layers in the mind that block it from when you go into flow practice. See, fear inventory is, you know, I like it um, uh, on a regular basis. But what I really like it for, where I really see the results of fear inventory, is when I go into flow practice. And all of a sudden, I'm like, holy shit, I don't have that response of reactivity, fight, flight, or freeze, that I always have, because I worked it out in my slow practice of fear inventory. That's where you see it. So what I would do, I would radically increase my oming. I would radically increase my fear inventory. And then all of a sudden, the Dharma gate, whatever you want to call it, will open. Your flow practice will open. And then you'll begin to see all of the shifts that have been taking place in you. You'll begin to see, excuse me, because in flow practice, everything is magnified. You'll see the shifts either that have, have taken place, but you also see in stark relationship what hasn't taken place, it needs to. You know, like, um, you know, like I do so much for inventory, and I have this, I just have a, f <laughs> I have a flight, I am a flight risk in everything I do. I'm just, that's just my, t um, like, I'm out of here. And, um, and so, like, you know, I just, I had a big flow practice, and I had the longest flow I have ever had without running, and then, you know, and then there was just that last one, woo, and I was out of there. So now, I, what I'm doing in my fear inventory is I'm just taking, it was like this, this four-minute thing <laughs> that, you know, was just big. And I'm just reverse engineering it in my fear inventory. So when that gate opens again, I'm not beholden to that habit. 
So the thing about fear inventory that comes up when you say it is it's a mind versus a body practice and the body release feels like what may be needed. And I imagine if I get the fears out of the way to do that, then I would be able to have the body right. release. Right. I mean, um, what's his name? Uh, some cool person. I think it's Joseph Kramer. But maybe not. It's somebody who I liked that I didn't expect to like. Said this thing... Um, and he uses the word shame, um, I would say fear, but um, the, de the definition that he uses of shame is disruption of natural flow. And so what, um, what you're doing in the slow practice of your fear inventory is you're decreasing the potential for habituated disruption of your flow. Because it gets the cortex part that would normally come in out of the way. You, what it. it does, what really what it does is it just drains the cortex of all of the stuck ideas that it's ever had. So it can have more expanse. As it has more expanse, more flow can come through it, which can, and then what you do is you take that autocatalytic cycle that naturally in us tends to go toward contraction and you flip it into expansion. Then I have the concern, which will go away hopefully when I do fear inventory, <laughs> that Evangeline was bringing up around um, sorry, Evangeline. If it comes out, then it, so it's big and it goes right boom. Now. Thank you. I, I, I didn't know if we'd make it to here in this program. I, I understand. I just want to mark it in your system. I know how big this is. For you to sit in this room in this way and really hold your space. Hmm. Harder to hold when you do that. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't really care. I, I, we just did what we're actually here to do, which is uh, lay a frame in your language center so that you can always come back here and you don't have to start fresh. That's what I was doing. Thank you. Now, your fear that Evangeline has is... Just so then when, it, when the block of not going through it gets out of the way, what if it's big and it goes boom? But uh, I might answer my own question. Well, that's like, always the fear. Yeah. Um, and I think um, on that, I have to be, again, I have to be honest, and I have to say my bias, and that's one of the reasons why I believe in God. Because I, I do, I've been through a lot of booms. And my, my see, I have ex experiential faith. I don't have, I don't, I don't believe in anything I can't touch. But I do have, ha I do have the experience that I've lived through things that people shouldn't live through. And so, and so then what begins to happen is you become like an ex-sports faith player. Does that make sense? Like you have to get more and more extremes in the way that you test how resilient this thing is. As you test it, you become more skillful. Then it begins to self... Huh? Well, it's not self it's, it's where one thing says yes to the other and the other thing says yes to the other. It, uh, self... Self-reinforced, thank you so much. I never would have gotten that one. That was like way too many syllables. So then, um, so then you, what begins to happen is your faith creates your skill and your skill creates your faith and then you're in, you're in the positive version of the negative flip side that most of us live in, which is trying to avoid danger, which keeps you in a place where danger keeps happening. See, danger doesn't come toward the things that, are, that have agency, that, ha you know, when I, that have the capacity to send energy out. Danger comes when, um, danger comes when it perceives that there's a, something that will receive it. Okay, so I just started doing fear inventory regularly, like, two months ago, and I saw, like, a good amount of results from it, um, but I'm still, like, I get unclear on, I guess, specifics of it, like, what would you suggest in terms of, like, what we should do for our practice, um, and then, like, in terms of, like, going deeper, I feel like a lot of times I get stuck, and I write the same fear inventory, like, a lot, and I feel like I'm kind of not getting anywhere with it. Yeah, I think, um, just like with Oming, um, there comes a dip. There's a dip in your fear inventory. You see these big, flashy results release. And then all of a sudden, um, it gets more subtle and more challenging. And I can tell you that the biggest fear inventories I have ever had were things like, um, 
I just, I, I've been, I'm, I'm in a great fear inventory time. Like, but there are things like, um, I have, oh, I just had one. I just had one, and I thought, oh, I want to put that on my fear inventory. There was somebody who came toward me, and I could feel that they were coming toward me really openly, and, um, and I, I had my attention in two places, and I, 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 like I could tell that they were being open and vulnerable at a new level for them, but I was, uh, honestly, I was, I was had my attention on Butch because I wanted to make sure he was taken care of, and so I gave her a cursory nod and then turned. I mean, like, legally, anybody could say I did the right thing. No one would say, because I was actually very loving in the moment, you know, it was like that, but it left residue in my system of, oh, I wish I could have showed up just a little, little bit more. And when you can begin to catch those moments, the threads that they lead you down to, I, I can guarantee you I'm going to hit some level of I'm not enough. Then I'm going to hit some level down here as I follow the threads through. Then I'll hit some level of um, if I am not aware and present, available to help everybody at all times, uh, I, I don't deserve, and I'll, and I'll go all the way down, and then there'll be like a clunk, and then that means I got the seed and I'm free. And, and, it, and for me, that's where the fear inventory really, really gets powerful, because most of what we live in is the off-gassing of the seeds. And so they're all, what, what we live in are different emanations of fear from a few core seeds. You know, I pulled out this, this one, the biggest one I've ever pulled out was uh, this dude that I don't really, that I don't really like. Um, took my material. It was some version of that. And, uh, and then when he was, he was saying in front of a group of people how helpful he had been to me. And uh, very, he's very NLP type person. And, there, and I lost the power of speech in that moment. Does that make sense? Like, I didn't say like, dude, what are you talking about? You're a total fucker. You know, and, he, and all these people were like, oh, we believe in him and we will follow him. Because, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, uh, I, we believe in him and we will follow him because he helped Nicole. It was, you know, like love by association. And, and my not saying anything colluded in him having that power, and then he ended up hurting some people in the same way he had hurt me. Does that make sense? And the guilt I felt it was just it was just unbearable. Like I, you know, and I actually had already done an inventory that day, two inventories, and then um, and then I was calling to read to the woman that I read to, and she was like, "This doesn't feel. It feels like there's more in you." Because I was reading my inventory from earlier that day. She was like, do another inventory, and I was like, ugh, stupid, and I did it. I can't believe I'm going to tell you guys this, whatever. Um, uh, uh, my disruptor is coming in <laughs> and saying, like, you're crazy. Um, but, you know, my dad was a child molester, and he had experiences with young girls and used me as bait, and so that exact behavior whoa, of me colluding with somebody who would cause harm. And I got that seed out. And I got free. I could forgive everybody in the whole experience because I got free of that. That's where fear inventory can take you. It's not just sort of like I have fear that I won't make enough money. I have fear that my girlfriend won't love me. It's when you, when you do this subtle work and every single time... And, and it also trains you to listen at the level of a whisper, which is such a powerful, powerful um, skill to have because you can hear it before it has to turn into the hammer. And so, you know, I do my fear inventory, and it'll just be like, I'll be like, why am I writing this next stupid line? You know, like, who really, like, I have, you know, I have fear that I'm not, that I'm going to run out of food. You know, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, I'm the 12-year-old girl who's totally um, rocked and standing in front of the refrigerator and there isn't enough food to cover the pain. 
that, those are the places that it can take you, and it takes you there with such elegance because it takes you there line by line by line by line by line. So it's, it never shocks you open to the place that you can't stay open. It just progressively and gently opens you and releases, and you, then you can just face and be rid of, face and be rid of. And then pretty soon what you just notice is you have a lot more space inside to move without the thoughts interfering and your capacity to sit in pain decreases and you just got to get that shit out fast and then you're clear again. It's like the, the realization that sanity can be one fear inventory away and you can have a total radical psychic shift. And then one more like tactical thing, um, how important is it do you think that we read to someone else? Because a lot of times I just write them and then I forget uh, to read it to someone else. I think it's pretty, um, I don't think it's vital to read every one of them. Um, if you've gone longer than a week without reading to somebody, if it, like if you've gone longer than five days without reading to somebody, um, you might look at that. You know, I, my experience is how it goes for me, I'll, I'll be like, God, I don't know why I'm crazy. I'm doing yoga, I'm fucking, I'm, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm doing my inventory. What's missing? And almost invariably it'll be that I haven't read to someone. I'm just impacted. Stuff just wants to come out. And, the, and there is this really profound feeling. I did an inventory. I read to, I don't know if you guys know Carol, but I read to Carol. And I just did this stupid little inventory. It was so dumb. It was about being a woman aging. That was the kind of thing. And I, I did the dumb inventory, and then I'm reading to her, and I was just sobbing. I, I didn't realize all that was in there, but the connection had it be that whatever was locked could flow out. Yeah? Good? 